This is week two of our series on the prodigal son. And as we mentioned last week, we're not just looking at the parable, we're trying to figure out how to interpret parables. So I'm gonna give you a tool in your tool belt this week. In fact, I think this is the single most important observation when interpreting any passage of the Bible. Here it is. Context is king. You have to pay attention to the context of any passage to really know what the author is saying. And in this particular case, we need to go back to Luke chapter 15, verse one and two. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. (laughs) But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. One of the observations, there's really two cultural assumptions. If you don't understand those, none of this is gonna make sense. Cultural assumption number one, righteousness is getting to the center of the circle. A lot of churches operate in that way as well. What does it mean to really be a good Christian? Well, you go to church, you you read your Bible, you, you, you pray. And they assumed that getting to the center of the circle meant you left those on the outside of the circle. The Pharisees might put it this way, birds of a feather flock together. And if Jesus is hanging around sinners, he must be one of them. Well, that leads to the second cultural assumption. Here it is. Sin is more contagious than righteousness. The Pharisees figured, if I'm righteous and I hang around sinners, they're going to rub off on me. Jesus assumed the exact opposite. That if I hang around sinners, I'm going to rub off on them. And the three parables that follow, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, are each a way of explaining why Jesus is hanging around with the sinners that so offended the Pharisees. So to get started, let's let's honestly answer this question as a group. If you grew up in church, was it a place that shared these two assumptions? And how did that affect your friendships? Thank you. 
This weekend, we talked about a Rembrandt painting. It was probably the last one he ever did, and specifically how he painted himself into it. The eyes of the father are blind, and Rembrandt was going blind when he painted this painting. And the hands of the father that are on the back of his son who's just come home, those are Rembrandt's own hands. And this begs the question, where are you? Are you a younger brother? Are you an older brother? Or this is the question of the weekend, are you the father? I gotta tell you, when I, when I considered that, it, it, it put me back on my heels because I had always thought that I had experienced some of the younger brother. I've experienced some of the older brother. But I think Rembrandt got it right, that our goal is to get to imitate the father, truly like father, like son. So let's, let's talk about that for a little bit. Who do you relate to more right now? The younger brother, the older brother, or the father? Why?
There are consequences for each of the three figures in this story. It's going to cost you something. And the cost of the younger brothers is pretty transparent. If you are foolish, if you are sinful, you're going to wind up poor and friendless. You're going to wind up in a pigsty, which was a terrible thing for a Jew, you know, because pigs were considered unclean animals. I think we all get the cost of being a a younger brother, of making a mess of our lives. I, like you, have experienced that. But what does it cost you and others around you when you are the older brother? Let's discuss that question, and if you can, give real-life examples.
So we've talked about the cost of being the younger brother. We've talked about the cost of being the older brother. Have you ever considered the cost? If you really become the father, if you decide I'm gonna be the one that welcomes others in, what's it gonna cost you? The father pretty much gave up all his dignity. In the ancient world, and even today in the Middle East, if a stupid son asks for the inheritance of his father, as Ashley talked about, it means you're saying to your dad, drop dead, I want my money now. It would require selling off a portion of the farm. You know how many fathers in the Middle East would do that? None, none. Because not only would it shame the family, it would, it would make him a laughing stock of the community. But our God did that. He gave you the choice of free will to walk away if that's what you decided to do. That's one cost to the father. Here's another cost to the father the, of running. Men in the Middle East do not run. In fact, it was, it's kind of a, a rule in the ancient world that the higher you were in social status, the slower you strolled down the street. Running was reserved for those who had a knife to their back or were a slave serving someone else. Here's the third thing it cost the father. A ring, a cloak, and sandals. I'm not talking about the economic cost. I'm talking about the cost of inviting a flagrantly disobedient son back home. Now, some of you can relate to that cost. Maybe you've had a child or a brother or parent who struggled with addiction. Or maybe they were sexually profligate. Or maybe they made decisions that were so selfish that it impacted the entire family. The cost of being the father in the story is huge. Because it is, it is the cost of reaching out again, of losing your dignity, of giving another person free will. And here's what I want you to talk about. And I, I, I want you to consider the weight of this question. Because there's not a right answer, there's not a wrong answer. But maybe it's something you've never considered before. Do you think that God the Father is vulnerable to your love?
Okay, one last thing about parables, and this is kind of a big deal. Parables are performative language. Here's what I mean. Sometimes when we speak, it's informative language. Uh, the bus leaves at 10. Uh, we're gonna go together as a family. You're invited. But other language is not informative, it's performative. In fact, most language, to be honest, is performative. I'll just be transparent. When I say to my wife, I love you, I'm not informing her of a fact. I'm trying to cause something to happen. You get my drift? Most of the time when we speak to other people, we're trying to move them into action. Such is the language of the, of the parables, all parables, but this one in particular. And when Jesus describes the father and these two sons. He's describing how it costs the father something to welcome his son back. It will cost the older brother as well. Ashley's gonna talk about the cost of the older brother next weekend. You don't wanna miss it as we conclude this parable series. Now, I want you to start thinking about what you're gonna hear this weekend in practical, real life terms. This is an important application for all of us, particularly as we approach Easter. Here's the application question for this week. What will it cost you to welcome others to CCV for Easter?